Hello everyone, this is our group project about the international impact of the Uyghur people in Western China. I'm Peter Delkis. I'm Kenyon Vance. I'm Owens Berry. And I'm Jason May. So, specifically within Western China, we're talking about the Xinjiang region, right here pointed out by the red area in this northwestern part of the map. Well, within this region, there are the Uyghur people, and the Uyghur people are an Islamic Turkic group. And within that region, there are 12 million Uyghurs. Now, out of those 12 million Uyghurs, over 2 million of them are being detained. That's the size of Utah's population. That's crazy. Who's detaining them? It's the Chinese government, and they're putting them in re-education camps. Well, these re-education camps are really just forced labor camps, and they're sterilizing people forcibly, specifically women, and they're taking away religious freedoms, and they're taking away their privacy by tons of surveillance. And this is all horrible and it's terrible for the Uyghur people, but it's also terrible for people around the world because it impacts international business and tons of brands around the globe. What led to this? What led to the divisions and conflicts between the Uyghurs and Chinese that ultimately sparked these camps you see here in this image? As to begin, there's a long history and tension between the Uyghurs and the Chinese because of religious differences and personal beliefs that differ from each other. So the Uyghurs uh, practice a Muslim uh, religious belief and the Chinese do not agree with this as they view it as extremist and almost as a harm to some of the regions in the country, specifically the Xinjiang region where they have these re-education camps. Another reason that led to this is the fear of foreign military Islamic groups coming with the Uyghurs in the Xinjiang region which is making the Chinese government lead to forced labor camps to gain profit. Something that the U.S. has actively done to uh, stop the Uyghur forced labor is a uh, passive bill called the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. Basically what this bill was doing is to impose certain bans on products that are uh, being used in China and imported into America. Uh, uh, so certain products that were being banned were uh, apparel products, hair products, um, cotton, and even computer parts. And the reason being is because of the Uyghur forced labor that Peter was talking about earlier and how they get little to no pay and they live in very poor conditions. But this act would affect many multinational companies that were connected to Xinjiang. And they were not happy about this because of the fact that they had such a, lo a low price point from China that other manufacturers, such as like the U.S. manufacturers, they would be a lot higher and they would pay a lot more for certain uh, products that they could just get from China at a cheaper rate. And so because of this, Apple, Coca-Cola, and Nike started lobbying against the act. They wanted the the bill to not be passed at all, or try to at least mitigate it so they can have more leeway in bringing more products from China. But it ended up being passed with a vote of four or six to three, showing that the U.S. was very adamant on not getting it passed, uh, on getting it passed in the U.S. So now we're gonna look at how this affects it internationally. Now, if we look at the history of China, the Xinjiang region has been known to have the Silk Road, connecting eight other nations. Now, while although it does have a legacy of textiles, it now has the unfortunate and disgusting labor camps that we have here in this area. Now, as we see here in this picture, this Uyghur woman is now picking from fields of cotton, wearing yellow and red, showing the symbolism of, Chinese, of the Chinese flag and its colors and how it's impacted these people. Moreover, the survey found in 2020 was that 82 well-known fabric-related and apparel brands have been caught, from, they've been caught sourcing from these factories and manufacturing plants in Xinjiang. Now, the U.S. has responded by putting sanctions on Xinjiang and its region, preventing all cotton and all apparels related that have been manufactured within that region from importing into the U.S. Now, how does China, how does China respond to that? Well, imagine you trying to shop at a Nike store in China. You're gonna try and go on your, your GPS device on your phone to try and go there. Well, too bad. China has now removed that feature of you finding the Nike store. They've been 
boyd china has been boycotting all western brands as a response to this now we see that Xinjiang cotton has been flourishing now, now that there are bans on U.S. Now that U.S. has banned cotton from being imported to the U.S., China now has more of an abundance of this cotton to be sourced to local domestic brands. So now we see other brands up on the rise, whereas other athletic apparel brands have just decreased in sales, other Western brands decreased in sales in China. And this has caused a cotton price surge, as we see here. 2020, 14,000 yuan for some cotton. And then now in 2021, 17,000 yuan for a pound of cotton. All right, in the, the Forced Labor Act that I was talking about earlier, shows very well what the US thinks about the forced labor that is happening in China. They publicly condemned China for labor camps over the past years, and they are very uh, clear that they do not support this. There was even a senator that tried to pr uh, propose a new idea where the people aren't trying to make the difference, but it's the companies. They want the, uh, the senator said that they wanted the companies to seize all trade with the, the China, even if it is with the labor, uh, forced labor or without the forced labor. They said to stop it completely so that China can take a big hit economically. And it would also be very helpful if allied countries were to help in this endeavor and uh, do the same follow suit. Um, because if the China was to take a hit uh, from this, it may, uh, may uh, make them realize what is, what, how this is affecting other people and that they should stop the forced uh, force labor and alter their ways and uh, have a better way of producing products. Um, but unfortunately, private companies have a different ideology. All they care about is low cost so that they can get bigger profits. It, at the end of the day, they think the, justify, uh, the ends justify the means. And because of that, uh, it doesn't look like they're going to try and make a difference. But the government and the, the common populace is uh, very against it. And like um, uh, Jason was talking about also, even in China, the populace is against it as well. But it has to start with the company. So, some of our perspectives. Um, one, we believe that this should stop. Clearly right here in this image, that is very abundant for us. But we, we think it's immoral uh, on many grounds, uh, putting people in camps, taking away their freedom. Um, you know, we built this country on freedom and, and at times we, we don't have that freedom, but that's what the country's founded upon and, and we believe that that should be the case for everyone around the world. You should be free and be put in these camps is, is, has a lot of negative impacts on People, but it, not, it has negative impacts that are going to last a long time too, as far as the people, the international business, and the economy. Well, also it relates to relationships. Our relationship has been strained with China. Many other countries' relationships have been strained with China, and Chinese uh, China's own government has had their relationships ruined with their own people. Also, it creates conflict. Uh, people all over the world are talking about conflict and going to war with China. It may happen, may not, probably not, hopefully not, but it still creates the conflict and creates the thought, which is never a good thing. So, and it's happened in all other regions of the world as well. And now we can't prove it to the uh, extent that we have been able to in China, but we definitely know and believe and have some evidence that it is happening around the world as well. And we think it should be stopped there too. Our perspectives have led us to formulate a few solutions on this problem happening not only in one area, but also around the world, as we can suspect. Um, to begin, the United Nations Human Rights Meeting. This comes a little tricky as China is a one of five permanent member on the UN Human Rights Meeting Council Board. So our solution, our fix to a problem as big as this would be renegotiate that permanent council board member and allow for a more fair um, integration of policies and what's, what's going on around the world. Uh, another fix would be to form an international coalition that aids the Uyghurs in the uh, Xinjiang region and basically allows them to have a bigger voice to stand up against such a big power as China. Uh, furthermore, we can all as a collective team stop aiding China's repressive capabilities, which we've seen already and mentioned earlier um, with the United States boycotts and even China's boycotting against this problem going on. Um, that's also labeled there, boycotting factories, forcing this Uyghur work will sustain and allow us to have a more ethical and moral way of international business. 
All right. Well, well thank you. We uh, appreciate your time for listening and watching. And if you have any questions, you can email us at our UTD emails. Thank you so much. All right, thank you.